Before we begin, uh, we must acknowledge that the land we work and live on is the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, Musqueam and Sulu nations. We're really thankful that we can host this event in such a beautiful place. And so we begin, I'm going to introduce our speaker and it's uh, just such a pleasure to be able to introduce her. We had originally planned for this to be an in-person meeting last year, but some kind of pandemic thing got in the way. So she is now joining us from her evening in the UK, in the Northeast of England. Catherine is a retired palliative care consultant physician from the UK. She's, she, I've known her for nearly three decades, which is a very scary thing we discovered the other day. And she's a very, very dear friend of mine. Um, she is extremely accomplished. We worked really hard together we shared many, many ups and downs, professionally and personally, as well as raising our spirits with cups of tea, which is definitely a theme, glasses of wine and lots of humour. Kath swapped out of an intended career in oncology when she first started. She did four years full-time and three years part-time training in palliative medicine, which um, wasn't a specialty then in the UK, but now is. She took up her first consultant job in the specialty 30 years ago and worked in hospitals, community and hospices in multidisciplinary palliative care teams throughout that time, developing services and authoring medical texts. Also, because that wasn't enough, intrigued by the emotional inner journey she observed these palliative care patients and families making, she took a postgrad qualification in cognitive behavior therapy and established the first CBT outpatient clinic for palliative care patients, and then went on to develop a skills course for physical health practitioners. She was awarded the fellowship of the BABCP in recognition of this work. And then feeling a little spare time on her hands after a full career, three decades of waiting for somebody to do something about the public misunderstanding of dying, she eventually was sufficiently exasperated to go on and do something about her, it herself and wrote a book called With the End in Mind. This book is an attempt to give dying back to society through stories of how people live while they're dying. It's now published in 12 different languages across Europe, South America and Asia and has generated invitations to teach in Australia, New Zealand and Canada. We're really lucky to have her talk to us today about talking about dying. Over to you, Kath. Thanks, Alison. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is really just an excuse for Ali and me to have a cup of tea, but the rest of you are really, really welcome to join us. Actually, because it's so close to bedtime, I've had a cup of tea previously, but I've swapped to blackcurrant juice now, just in case you think it's, you know, rum and blackcurrant or something. Sadly, just water. So I'm really, really delighted to, to be here. And I really wish that I could have been with you properly and in person. But I'm hoping that, you know, someday this pandemic will lose its grip on us. And I'll still have a friend in Vancouver then. So I guess maybe one day I'll get over there. So I'm trying to make my slides appear and that just takes a little bit of steering, but there we are. And now I hope you can see a slideshow. Not if you can see a slideshow, hooray. So I'm just gonna mull some things over and tell us some stories really. This, this could go anywhere. I haven't got a script, but I have got some slides that might keep me on track. Um, and if I go really badly off track, which, you know, is not unknown, then Alison will start waving furiously. And I can, I can only see a few boxes because I've got slides on my screen, but I can see Jane and Alison who can start you know, pointing at their watches if it's all taking too long. So thinking about talking about dying and what I really want to talk about because of who you are and what your experience is, is about the practicalities, the practical compassion in action that's part of what you do. And because this is um, an education meeting, it's the, there has to be some data. So there's a graph, yay. But mainly this is storytelling. So I was trained in Britain. And when I first moved into what we now call palliative care, um, 
it wasn't such a specialty. Dame Cicely Saunders had founded St. Christopher's Hospice, which actually Alison had worked in before I met her. Um, and her really important words, how people die remains in the memories of those who live on. I, I think that's so important, but one of the things we have to think about is what is it that they're remembering? And how often are they traumatized by what they remember? Because what they thought they were seeing and hearing was a misinterpretation of the events that were unfolding before them. Because people, don't understand dying and part of our practical compassion who walk alongside people at the very end of their lives is that we need to actually restore the public understanding. So I promised you a graph and here it is. Um, this is a story about a lady called Annie and Annie was born in 1900. So life expectancy for girls. Let me talk you through the graph a little bit. Um, this origin, the original graph is from the Office for National Statistics in the UK, showing these two lines, the purple line and the green line, which are life expectancy at birth for girls, which is always a little bit higher than boys. Um, and then over that, I've tried to superimpose because I don't know, I don't know where you're all from in Vancouver, but when I went to Ontario, everybody was from Scotland. So these are the Scottish data superimposed over the top. And again, girls are the yellow line, and boys are the blue line. Um, and then I went to Statistics Canada with some help from my friend. Um, and so these are the Canadian data, um, life expectancy at birth for girls is the turquoise line and triangles and for boys is the red line and triangles and I'm sorry I couldn't get the Canadian data any further back than these but I think what it shows us is that life expectancy at birth was much of a muchness for the 1900s the 1800s the 1700s it wasn't terribly different and it wasn't terribly long but when Annie was born at the wrong end of Liverpool um, in 1900 things were starting to change. And the thing that was really starting to change was that people had better life, uh, housing conditions, there was better sanitation. So deaths in childhood became less frequent and particularly the early childhood immunization programs were also starting. And that was happening on both sides of the Atlantic. So Annie, born in 1900, was the same age as the year. And when she was in her twenties, by that age, she'd had a very 19th century experience of dying and death. As the uh, oldest child in quite a big sib ship, she'd helped to look after her siblings when they were sick and when, when one of them was dying. She'd helped to look after her parents who were dying of illnesses that we would associate with old age in their 40s, in their late 40s. So they lived a long life for the time that they were born. And by the time she got to her mid thirties, which was in the mid 1930s, when Europe had been through a depression and was now in political turmoil on the eve of World War II, her oldest child had died already of diphtheria because diphtheria immunization hadn't begun then. And when she was 35, her husband died of peritonitis because they couldn't afford healthcare when he got appendicitis. That left her with three children, one of whom was my mum and another baby on the way. And then over the course of the 20th century, we see this, the, the white line down the middle of this chart is to remind us about 1948, when my Nana was 48, which was when the National Health Service started in Britain. And healthcare became free at the point of need for every citizen in the United Kingdom at that point. Now look at what's happened to life expectancy at birth. It's carried on growing, but now it's because of different things. It's because of new things, antibiotics, better anesthetics, which mean longer and more probing surgery, new anti-cancer treatments, new ways of supporting people with organ failure, organ transplantation. All sorts of amazing new things were starting to happen. And life expectancy at birth moved from just over 50 years for girls in 1900 to nearly 85 years of age for babies born in 2010. So that is remarkable. So what about this little girl whose life expectancy on average at birth was, well, for the wrong end of Liverpool, probably in her mid-40s? Well, 
shortly before her 97th birthday, which the mathematicians amongst you will calculate was in 1997, um, I sat and had a chat with her uh, about my work as a palliative care doctor and looking after people at the end of their lives. And she was talking about the two things that had surprised her. One was that she was still alive, but the other was that she was a little bit concerned now about her four surviving children. So remember, she's in her 90s. So they are in their 50s and 60s. And she's worrying about them because she's their mum. And she's worrying about how they're going to be after she's died. Because she explained to me, they were too little to remember their dad dying. Two of them weren't born when their brother died. And they'd had no close personal family bereavement since then. In a single generation, my mum's generation, I think on both sides of the Atlantic, people forgot what dying looked like because instead of staying at home and being looked after by your family when you were so sick that it looked like you were going to die, you got sent into a hospital where stuff could be done that very often did stop people dying, which is why life expectancy was so much better. But we carried on doing that even at the very end of a very great old age or with widely extensive cancer or with heart failure that was way beyond repair. So we carried on expecting hospitals to turn death away. And of course, it didn't turn death away, but it stopped death happening at home in a familiar place with us recognising its pattern. We understand things through stories and because we don't know what we don't know, we replace our knowledge with stuff that we've snipped from elsewhere. So a lot of the stuff gets snipped from soap operas. Now we've got a variety of soap operas. This is one from the BBC EastEnders. Um, and at the end of each year, the British soap operas, each individual one produces a little YouTube video of the deaths during that year. And the deaths are by stabbings and falling from a great height and cataclysmic vehicle crashes. Um, they're always the unusual and the macabre. They are very rarely ordinary dying, but they do what they need to do to keep their audiences transfixed. And it's not unique to Britain. I know that this happens all over the world and you know that it happens in Canada too. Now this stuff matters because actually people listen to soap operas and they form opinions in their minds that they might not even have recognized. They make assumptions about the way things are. So a couple of years ago, I was in Peru at a book festival and Peru had had a problem with not enough donors for solid tissue organ donation. So the Peruvian government in early 2018 asked the two most popular Peruvian soaps to include transplant stories in their plot lines over 2018. And when I was visiting Peru in uh, November of 2019, that was the only change that had happened, but it had trebled organ donation rates in Peru. Now, admittedly from quite a low starting level, but it just shows you the sort of impact that these stories have on people. So it really matters if we're being offered bad information by the sorts of dramas that are regularly consumed by people. At the same time, of course, we really love death as entertainment. So we have computer games where we shoot things and we might get killed too. We will go to the cinema and watch things that will terrify us for the thrill and the giggle of doing it. And of course, at the same time as all that, bad news sells stories. So dying stories hit the headlines. The difficulty is, of course, that these aren't representative stories. So if you think about air travel, if you only knew about aeroplanes, what you read in the newspapers, you'd just never get on a plane, would you? Just you would know that they all fall out of the sky or the pilots get drunk or fights break out in midair or they land at the wrong airport. And in fact, all of the usual plane took off on time flew with that incident, landed at the right airport and everybody got off safely, that doesn't get reported. So what gets reported about dying in our media are the kind of plane crashes of dying. So we've got these difficult myths, but I think perhaps in healthcare, this is the most difficult myth of all, which is the myth that CPR is a treatment for dying. 
So I want you to just take a moment to think about CPR. CPR is a really important first aid measure. And it's really important that members of the public are trained in CPR so that we can administer it for somebody who in unexpected circumstances collapses because their heart stops. Everything else is still working. At the moment that the heart stops beating, the brain was full of blood with oxygen in it, the liver, the kidneys, the guts, everything was okay. And if we can keep oxygenated blood circulating around that person's body until we get them to hospital and the cause of their cardiac arrest can be put right, which in about one person out of 10 it can be, then we will have saved that person's life. But nine times out of 10, we won't be successful. But that's only when the heart stops first. And the walk that we are usually doing with the people in our care is a walk as the organs gradually start to fail and eventually the person is seriously ill. Most of their organs are not working very well anymore. And eventually after a period of diminishing consciousness and breathing slowing down and stopping a few minutes later because it's not getting any oxygen supply anymore, the heart stops last. That's not a cardiac arrest, it's dying. CPR is not an appropriate treatment at this point. But somehow we've backed ourselves into a corner where we've got to have difficult conversations that are hard for people to understand, that give us permission to allow them to die naturally without moving all their family out of the way and starting to press on their chests. And I don't quite know how we ended up in this difficult position, but we're in the same position on both sides of the Atlantic now. So public understanding of dying could be better, I think we could say. They are beset by misinformation and media distortion. If they watch dying on screens, then it is either trivialised or it's sensationalised and they don't see dying very often or if they do they don't trust their own experience so I meet a lot of people at book festivals when you go to a book festival you do a talk or maybe you get in, get interviewed by somebody and then at the end you sit at a table with a pile of books and people come along and they buy a book and then you sign it for them and what happens when I go to book festivals is every person comes and tells me their bereavement story so my book signings take absolutely ages. What actually happens is really rather lovely is people tell each other the stories in the queue and they've made friends with each other and swap telephone numbers by the time they actually get to the front of the queue. But what they say to me is this, when my dad, mum, husband, wife, friend, child died, and then they look around to see if anybody's listening, they say, it was it was okay. Do you know, in fact, it was even really rather nice. We were there, it was gentle. We knew what was happening. They were very sleepy. Their breathing became very gentle. And then they just very gently stopped breathing. And we feel so lucky that it was so unusual. We never ever tell other people what it was like because we know that normally dying is terrible and we wouldn't want other people to be upset that our dear person had such a good experience. And I have to say to them, I'm delighted your dear person had that fantastic experience and that you all saw it because that's normal dying. That's ordinary dying. Please tell everybody because what you saw is what we should all be expecting. What you saw is what we should all be demanding as the, as the kind of standard of end of life care. So we are trying to deliver a service to people who don't understand. And we can't keep trying to solve this one family at a time anymore. It is a public health issue and we're going to have to start to manage it as a public health issue. So one of the things that you'll notice is that there are new ways now of telling stories where once upon a time we might have gathered together and had a storyteller in our community or we borrow books from the library or we buy books. Actually, 
there are new things happening as well. And one of them is podcasts. So a lot of people get um, information from podcasts. They listen at home or they download them and they listen while they're commuting. So this is a very popular one from the BBC in Britain, uh, You, Me and the Big C. And this is a, a podcast run by three young women who all have cancer talking about anything and everything. Um, what happens to your skin during treatment and what kind of makeup fixes you can find for that? What happens to fertility, changes in mood, sex, dying, what to tell the children, what it feels like to be a young person dealing with your parents being agonised by the fact that you are going to die before them. It's an absolutely amazing, brave, courageous, real thing. And it's got an absolutely enormous following. You've got your own Brian Goldman on CBC, White Coat, Black Art. Um, and last year, for example, he talked to Carla. Some of you may have, may have heard this. Um, and she died of cervical cancer and her kind of terminal illness made her want to help people to be more embracing of screening, to make screening more inclusive um, and how women can't, don't get lost to follow up like she did uh, between screening and diagnosis. So there are people who blog their individual cancer journeys. There are people who write books. Uh, the book in the middle here actually started off as a blog and then was printed as a book. Um, many of you will probably have read Paul Kalanithi's magnificent When Breath Becomes Air. So there are stories like that out there that will give people a flavor, but of course, they are individual stories, and that's not the same as an umbrella view of the process of dying. So this marker slide is a slide to tell me to just pause for a moment and give us a chance to talk to each other. And I'm switching that back on so I can see the cameras that are on because it is really nice to see some faces and see if there are any questions and things that you'd like to discuss for the next few minutes. We don't have any questions in the chat box at the moment. If anybody has questions or comments they want to type away now. And if anybody's got any good Canadian blogs they could rec recommend, you stick them in the chat box as well so that I can collect them because I'm trying to find resources wherever I go. Looks like everybody's just enjoying hearing you, Kath. Perhaps carry on for now. Stunned silence. Right. Let's get back to the slides. So if we're thinking about stories, if we're thinking about that we understand the things about ourselves by looking back over time and seeing how we got to where we are now through all of the life experiences that we've had and we make our stories. What about our stories about end of life and our group experience? Because the experience in this virtual room of what happens at the ends of people's lives is huge. There are 60 people here, each of whom have seen dying many, many times. So I would like you to just stop and think for a moment and ask yourself a couple of questions. So the first question is, how many deaths have you seen? How many people have you worked alongside at the very end of their lives? And you might be quite surprised if you think about the number of years that you've been in the work that you're in times the caseload that you would norm normally carry and the previous jobs that you've done. And I want you to think about what are the patterns that you recognize in the way people are towards the very end of their lives. And I just ask everybody to check that they're muted because I can hear conversation somewhere. So I do the maths for this every now and again. And over my 30 years in palliative care, I worked in two different hospices. I worked in a community palliative care service and I worked in the big hospital service that I, I worked with Alison in for many years. And eventually that was all of my job. And you know, in palliative care, 
you there isn't enough money there aren't enough staff so there's like half a doctor for a massive palliative care team and gradually over time we were able to build up our resources so all of the patients who are known to the palliative care team as a whole are known to their doctor so i've done the maths by working out how many deaths the teams that i have been embedded in have managed over my practice lifetime and i have to tell you that it's somewhere between 10 and 15,000 people. And every time I do the maths, because I think that can't possibly be right, I still end up with that number. So I think it's important that we can say we've seen this a lot of times so that when we're talking to people about it, we're not talking about my friend, my mum, my husband, we're talking about dying. We're talking about death in general from a huge experience. And there are patterns that we recognize and they give us the hunches that we follow. So how do you know when it's time to make sure the family around that bed? What is it that you see or hear or notice that says to you, actually, you know, if a family have got to get over from the East, from the, from the, from the East Coast, it's probably time that they were coming now. Um, if family have got to get here from Australia or from Europe, it's time for them to start traveling. What is it that you're seeing? What are the patterns that you're recognizing? And what do you do to enable families to own the space around the bed if somebody's in hospital rather than in their own home? How do you help people to be good visitors? Because if you pop in to visit somebody who's just had a hernia repaired, then you know you take grapes and you take flowers and then you get to the hospital and you discover that the hospital's got a no flowers anti-infection policy, hey ho. Um, and then you sit by the bed and you chat and you chat and you chat and then you go again. And that's fine. But actually for somebody who's really weary and approaching the end of life, they don't really want your grapes. They might smile at the flowers. They can't really listen to you chat and chat and chat. They haven't got that much energy. So how do we advise people to be? So I used to tell families to bring in a familiar duvet, get the photographs, stick them on the, on the bedside locker, um, bring your slippers, because you're going to be sitting for a long time. Move the chair. There's an orthopedic style chair, isn't there, beside the hospital bed. And if you sit in it, then you're sitting in the chair and you're sitting shoulder to shoulder with the person that you're trying to visit. Um, and we don't sit like that at home. We also don't sit and gaze at each other and just chat and chat and chat either. Neither do we wipe each other's fevered brow particularly often. What we do in our house, family secrets, is we generally ignore each other, kind of nod, smile, give each other cups of tea, appreciate each other's presence, but actually are very relaxed in each other's presence. So I ask families to move the furniture so that they're sitting in a place where they can do their knitting or a crossword or read the newspaper. And when they look up, they can see the person they've come to visit and they can lean forward, they can touch their hand if they want to do that. They're occupying the space together, but they're not exhausting themselves or each other in the process of being visitor. And the thing that I want us to talk about is how do we narrate the deathbed? How do we tell the story of what is happening to this person in the bed, to the people around the bed, so that they will really understand what it is that's happening? So I want to think a little bit now about us telling our stories. And some of us have begun to tell our stories in the public domain. So. Atul Gawande's magnificent being mortal was the thing that made me think, actually, do you know what? People can write a book about this. So I had a go. Um, Rachel Clark is another palliative care doctor in England whose book, Dear Life, is a really beautiful account of her uh, transfer from being an investigative journalist through medical school into finding her way into palliative care. And Christy Watson is a very, very experienced um, children's nurse and intensive care nurse and her book The Language of Kindness is about how our attitude makes a difference at the bedside and again absolutely beautiful book and they're all available uh, on Amazon including the ones by British authors because actually people want to know about dying and what they need to know is what is going to happen what's it going to be like and will I be able to bear it and is it just going to terrify and traumatize the people I love if they're around the bed? 
So we owe it to them to put their minds at ease by helping them to know what to expect and to plan ahead. Now, I didn't know what to expect by the time I'd been working in medicine for about four years. So I was starting off training to uh, work in cancer medicine. So in the British system, that means that you qualify after five years of medical school. You do a pre-registration year, six months in medicine, six months in surgery in those days. It's different from that now. Um, and you are the go-to doctor for everybody during that year. So anybody who was sick enough to die on the ward, I would be the doctor at the bedside, talking to the family, changing the medications if they weren't able to swallow any more, whatever. Um, but largely, of course, the job of the junior doctor is to stop the person from dying. So I would be looking at one person's oxygen levels and somebody else's fever and somebody else's kidney function tests and thinking, how am I going to change this to stop them getting worse so that this person doesn't die? And so wanting to do oncology, I chose jobs then that included hematology, lots of people with leukemia in the 1980s. We were really, really bad at curing leukemia, nothing like it is now. Um, I worked in the regional cancer center and there I discovered that finding the cure for cancer wasn't really as exciting as I had hoped it would be. The most interesting patients in the cancer center were the people who knew they weren't going to be cured and where they needed to get home as soon as they could because time was precious, sorting out their pain, sorting out their nausea or their itch or their cough or their mobility, being able to twist your arm around so that you can get it into the sleeve of your clothes so that you can get yourself up and dressed so that you can walk to the shops with a walking stick that keeps you safe. I know we've got allied healthcare professionals with us today, you see, so I'm minding what I say. And people who are thinking about what their legacy is, how am I going to tell my family? What are my spiritual beliefs? What spiritual preparation do I want to do? All of those things. And that was so much more interesting than taking blood and spinning it in a centrifuge and drawing graphs, which seemed to be the way that we were going to cure cancer. And of course, we've made enormous strides. Those people who stayed in that department and did those jobs made a huge difference to the patients we're looking after now. But around about the time that I was having my doubts, a hospice was built in our city by public subscription. And I wrote to them and said, do you think you might have a job for a junior doctor? And they said, well, yeah, come and work for us. So I transferred on a free transfer from oncology into working in a hospice. It wasn't even called palliative care in those days. And I'd been there a little while when one of our patients, a patient of whom I was a little bit frightened, uh, had an encounter that really has changed my life. So Sabine was a French lady who had fought for the resistance in France during the Second World War and then had come to live in England because she'd married a British airman who'd parachuted in uh, to France to help build radios for the resistance. And they'd never had children, which was a great sadness to them, but they'd had a very happy life together. And he had died about 10 years previously. And now she was in our care with metastatic colorectal cancer, with metastases in her liver, now very tired, bed bound, and clearly approaching the end of her life. So in the bathroom one day, sitting on a chair after her bath, having her hair done just so, because Sabine's hair was always done just so by one of the nurses, Sabine confessed that she was frightened of being overwhelmed by pain as her disease progressed. Now, the nurse could have said, you don't need to worry about that, Sabine, because we're really good at pain management here. And I promise you that we'll do everything to manage your pain. But she didn't say that because she was a very wise person. She said, tell me about what you're worried about, Sabine. And I think the fact that they were looking at each other through a mirror rather than face to face allowed this incredibly self-contained, poised woman to be really vulnerable in front of this nurse and to explain that if she was overwhelmed by pain on her deathbed, then she would despair and despair in her French Catholic universe is a mortal sin. And therefore she would die in despair 
in sin and not go to heaven. So that would be bad enough, I think, in anybody's theology. But the really awful thing for Sabine was she was so sure that her husband was in heaven. And so they would be, sat they would be separated for eternity. Now, that is a huge spiritual existential deal. And it's a little bit about pain, but it's largely not about pain at all. So the nurse helped Sabine back to bed. And then she came down to the office to find the boss, the consultant in this hospice and explained about the conversation she'd just had. And he said, well, obviously we need to go and talk to her. And he said to me, you, you come as well, you'll find this interesting. Now, I was quite new, um, but I knew a lot about pain and I'd recently passed some exams and I was about 27, you know, you know the last age where you know everything. So I'm afraid I was that girl. So I wondered why he wanted me to come because I knew about pain and they were going to talk about pain control, weren't they? But anyway, I was a good girl and I went and I took a seat on one of those little stools. I don't know whether you have them in Canada, but they're all over hospitals and hospices in England. Stools that patients put their feet on, but they're not really high enough to get their feet high enough and you've got to stick loads of pillows and cushions on them as well. Anyway, so I sat at the bottom of the bed on the stool and my boss asked Sabine where he should sit. Now, he was fluently bilingual, which is quite unusual in England. Um, and they very often chatted in French in the evenings and we could always see that she was flirting with him. So of course, when he said, where shall I sit? She patted the bed beside her. So he sat on the bed um, and the nurse sat in the chair and I could sit and see the three of them in a triangle. And he said, I heard that you were really worried about being overwhelmed by pain while you're dying, Sabine. And I thought, I'm not sure that you could possibly start a conversation with that sentence. That's terrible. What is he doing? And she said, we, oui, because she was French. And he said, I'm really sorry that you're worrying about that. Um, and I wondered whether it might help you if I explained to you what we normally see when somebody is dying. What dying usually looks like and now sitting on my little stool I am really really uncomfortable what is going on here this guy is a maniac how can you talk about dying with a dying person and she said we oui. and she got hold of his hand and started to stroke it and he then asked her in French whether he whether she would prefer him to speak in French or in English and she replied in French that they should speak in English for the others, nodding at the nurse and myself, who she knew wouldn't have French adequate for this conversation. So the rest of the conversation was in English. And he said to her, so I can describe what we see. And if it's uncomfortable for you at any point, you just tell me and I promise I will stop. Is it all right? And she said, oui. So he said, well, it's an interesting thing, Sabine, that it doesn't seem to matter what it is that people are dying from, you know, um, lung troubles, kidney troubles, cancer, towards the very end of their lives, the pattern is very similar. And this is the pattern. The first thing we notice is that people just don't have enough energy. And because they're so tired, they sleep a lot and sleep recharges their energy. So they might have an afternoon nap and then they'll feel a little bit more energy for a while and then they're tired again and they need another sleep and then they have a bit more energy and you might even have noticed that starting to happen already and she said oui. and he said that's good and I thought you can't say that's good because you just said that's the beginning of dying and now she said that's what's happening to her and then you said that's good and I want to get under the bed here and hide this is so uncomfortable and she said we oui. I sleep, then I wake, then I eat, then I sleep, then I wake, then I bathe. And she described a waking sleeping cycle through her day. And he said, well, that's good because what it shows us is that you're following the normal pattern. So shall I carry on and describe what's likely to happen next? And she said, we, oui, you're getting the drift of this now, aren't you? She said, well, what we tend to find is that people gradually sleep more and they're awake less. And if their illness isn't affecting their mind or their brain, then when they're awake, it's still them. 
same sense of humour, still glad to see their visitors, but not very much energy to chat for very long. And as time goes by, what we find is that people are awake less and asleep more. And during that phase, something very interesting happens. What we find is that maybe there's a phone call, maybe there's a visitor the person's really been looking forward to seeing, and we try to wake them up and we can't waken them. It's very interesting. Later on, they wake up, they tell us they've had a lovely sleep, but we know they weren't just asleep, Sabine. We know that for a period of time, they were unconscious. They were in a coma. Do you want me to say it in French? She said, no, no, je comprends, coma, oui. So he said at that point, it might be that like you, who's taking regular painkillers to stop your pain from coming back, we need to think of a different way to make sure people can take their medicines that stop them having symptoms because we don't want them to miss a dose because they're asleep and then wake up and the symptoms have come back. And then they went off into a completely unnecessary digression into how French people prefer suppositories to tablets anyway. And so I'll, I'll spare you all of that. He went on to describe how we very often will change their drug, same drug, same relative dose, adjusted for it being an injection, but usually tiny little needle under the skin through a syringe pump. So the pain or the itch or the nausea, whatever the symptom is, is kept away. And do you understand about that? Yes, she says. And then at the very end of somebody's life, he said, what we find is that they don't wake up anymore. They are unconscious. And as they become more deeply unconscious, eventually the only part of the brain that's still working is the bit that drives their breathing. And now the breathing is just a reflex. It's completely automatic. They've got no sense of their throat or of their chest. So they breathe in and out automatically. And some of the time it can be very deep and they can breathe through a closed throat. So they make a kind of moaning noise. And it's just because they don't know that their vocal cords are closed. We always check, but it's not that they're trying to speak. It's not that they're moaning and distressed. It's simply a noise that people make when they're very deeply unconscious. And some of the time the breathing might be quite fast, but shallow because it moves between deep and shallow. And if your nieces and nephews were here, they might worry that you were breathless. And we'll check, but almost always, it's just part of that reflex breathing pattern of very deep unconsciousness. And towards the very end of somebody's life, what we start to see is changes in the breathing where it gets slower and there are pauses and then eventually there's a breath out that just isn't followed by another breath in. By this stage, she is sitting bolt upright. Her eyes are locked on his eyes and she's stroking his hand and nodding. So he said, it's not like on the cinema. There's no sudden rush of pain at the end. There's no feeling of fading away. It's just very, very gentle. And she says, yes, that's what I saw with my husband. I didn't know it was always like that. And she relaxed, she lay back against the pillows. She closed her eyes, she smiled, she kissed his hands. And then she told us that we were not wanted anymore. During that episode, I had been listening, starting off feeling so awkward, so in the way, so obtrusive and so horrified that he was trying to describe dying when, of course, obviously one cannot describe dying. And as I listened, I heard him describe all the deaths that I'd seen over my previous four years training. The problem was I'd never stepped back and looked at the pattern before. I'd been so busy worrying about that person's oxygen and that person's blood pressure and that person's kidney function that I hadn't stepped back and seen that there's an overarching pattern happening to each of these people. And as he described it, I recognised it and I thought, yes, this is how people die. And what is fascinating is that we can describe it. And when we describe it, this is what happens. 
the person moves from terror of the unknown to an understanding and an expectation of something they feel they can deal with. And what an amazing gift it is that we can give people that information. It was transformational for me, it changed my career, and it really is responsible for me having written a book. Because I think what we're talking about is midwifing dying. In Britain, pregnant women are looked after by midwives. We very occasionally might see an obstetrician, but that's usually because things are not running smoothly. But almost all of the details of care during pregnancy and during delivery will be handled by a midwife. And certainly if you meet an obstetrician during delivery, it's because things are not running smoothly. Midwives talk to pregnant women and their birth partners about pregnancy, about what's going to happen as the pregnancy evolves, about what will happen on delivery day. They do cognitive rehearsal of how it will feel as there is bearing down as on your perineum, how they will ask you not to push until they tell you that you're ready to push. They make you practice the breathing that you will do to not push. They help you to understand what to expect during birth of a baby. And then during the birth of the baby, the midwife talks to you about this is that thing that we talked about. And it doesn't feel anything like you expected it to feel like, does it? But this is that bearing down feeling. This is that desire to push. This is that feeling like you need to do a great big poo, but actually it's a baby. We need to be midwifing dying in the same way, helping people to know what to expect, make their plan, who will help, who will support, what will be the backup. And then as a midwife monitors mum and baby to make sure that everything is going well. So during a palliative care phase, we're getting familiar with somebody's symptoms, we're planning for any emergencies that we can anticipate, and we're working up what we would do to step up if, for example, the person had seizures or to step back if they had a crisis, which we discussed that they didn't want to go to hospital for, but we wanted to wrap increasing care around them. So it's all about more care, even though there may be less intervention, less of the stuff that we think of as treatment. And then being companions at the deathbed, explaining what's going on, narrating it as it evolves. This breathing, what it means, how do you think your person looks? Have, have they looked this peaceful all night? Drawing their attention to what is to be noticed, because what we're doing is normalizing normal dying and starting the stories that make sense of this person's living and dying, that families share with each other in bereavement. And every single time we are supporting somebody who's dying, we have an opportunity to educate the village, which is their people around them. It's a remarkable privilege that we have. So how are we going to start that? Well, we have to start with the preparation. So when we're seeing people for whatever purpose we're seeing them, we can start by saying, well, as well as the thing that I'm here to do today, when we finish talking, I'd like to take a little bit of time to talk about the care that you'd like in the future. And our patients aren't silly. If we say, have you got any concerns about what might happen to your health in the future? They will take us to the place that we want to go. A set of questions I find really useful is to ask people to help me to understand whether they have sometimes moments where they have a worse dread or moments where they have a best hope. Help me to understand those so that if things change in the future, I can work with you to try and make sure that the way things progress is as close as it can be to your best hope and as far away as we can keep it from your worst dread. What do we need to do now to make sure things turn out more like your best hope? And then let's keep checking that as we go forward. And really what we're doing is we're embarking on a goals of care conversation, but we're not calling it that. It's a conversation about whether your priority, for example, is to live as long as possible. I don't care what you do to me. I don't care how terrible the treatment is. I don't care how long I have to spend in hospital. I want to live as long as possible. Okay, tell me about that. What are the milestones that you want to achieve? And let's think about how realistic they are. So uh, you live in Vancouver and your granddaughter in England is getting married next year. 
and you've got end stage uh, pulmonary fibrosis. You aren't oxygen at home. We know that you are not going to be able to fly. So what are we going to do to help you to celebrate this wedding because you can't get there in person? Are you going to be able to discuss wedding dresses with her? Do you want to find your wedding photographs and send her copies of them so she can see what your bouquet looked like so that she might like to model her bouquet on yours? What's, what's your plan for being a participant in this wedding, even if you can't get there? Because I don't want to die before this wedding. Even if I can't be there, I want to be alive when this wedding happens. Can you envisage a time or circumstances when that goal might change? Well, actually, I just want to see her through to this wedding. OK. Or no, I just want to live forever. OK, we might have to have another conversation about that at another time. But what we're trying to do is work out where this person would set the balance between the length of life left and the comfort and quality of their living. Other people are very clear from quite early on that it's not about how long they live. It's about how well they live. And what does a good quality of life mean for that person? And have any things already happened that are making that difficult for them that we, they would like us to address? And again, can you envisage circumstances when these girls might change? So our previous patient's granddaughter has had the wedding and it was marvellous. And now she's changed her goals and she doesn't really mind how long she lives now. She's had the joy of being at that wedding by Zoom and then seeing all of the photographs and they've sent her a slice of cake and they've dried some of the flowers and they've sent those to her and it's marvellous. And now I can die happy. I just want to live as comfortably as possible for the time that's left. And then guess what? The granddaughter is pregnant. I've got to live to see this baby born. And we've changed the goal again. And that's the thing about goals of care. It's not an event. It's a process. And it's in transition a lot of the time. So we don't have a conversation with a form. We have a conversation about the goals. And then there is a form that we need to fill in. The form that I use in England is called an emergency health care plan. And when I've had this conversation with a patient, I go away and I apply what they told me to the questions and the boxes that have to be filled in on the emergency health care plan. It's a computer based thing, but I print it out as a PDF and I handwrite in pencil what I think the things were that the person has discussed with me. And then I go back with it and I say, I need to get this form right. It's all about you. Let me read it through with you and you can help me to make sure that I've got the details right and we can change anything that I've got wrong. It sometimes takes me two or three visits to fill in the advanced care planning paperwork. But actually, I never start the conversations with the papers there. It's more about understanding somebody's values than ticking boxes on a clipboard. So this is my next pause point. So I can see you all again. Oh, hooray, there are things in the chat box. Have we got some questions? We have, we have some questions. We also have some comments and some blogs and podcast suggestions, which is Oh, thank really you. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so maybe we'll start with one of the questions which came from, we do have some hospice volunteers who are with us today saying that they're not really very comfortable explaining the dying experience to somebody themselves and would probably call for a doctor to do that. What could they say? Oh, so I love that we have hospice volunteers here. And one day when I've stopped doing all this madness, that's that's my career goal to be a hospice volunteer. And it's difficult, isn't it? Because some of you actually have had long careers in healthcare before you were hospice volunteers, but you can't be that person now. And we have to respect the rules of the organisation that we're volunteering for. But I think that we can start to have conversations about, do you have things that you're worried about and what, what are those things? And I think we can gently probe what those worries are. And if people are worried about, for example, frightening their families during their dying or giving away the family secrets during their dying or whatever it is, we can talk about our experience, you know, that we've seen a lot of dying and actually that's not usually the way it looks. And 
for the illness that you've got, you probably need to talk to one of our doctors about the precise details of the sorts of things that might happen on the way there. But at the very end of people's lives, they usually have reached a point where they've lost consciousness completely. And obviously when you're unconscious, you have, you have no discomfort. Um, and that families usually see people have very gentle breathing changes and gently stop breathing. So if you wanted more detail than that, I can go and get the doctors to talk to you. But that's something that you could talk to your neighbours about, that you could talk to your families about, that you could talk to people in your book club about, that you could talk to people in your flower arranging society about. Because it should be just something that human beings know and talk to each other about. So maybe it's time to talk to the volunteer manager about how stretchy the envelope of conversation is in the organisation that you work in. I, I would recommend actually perhaps saying, listen, we've been we've had this bit of a challenge from this crazy English doctor last week. What do you think about that? Because I don't want to encourage you all to go and terrify the, uh, the organisation that you're working with. But I think this is just such a natural conversation and the relationship that volunteers in daycare, volunteer visitors, volunteer drivers develop with the people who are using the hospice services can be very close, they can be very intimate. You might be the right person to be there. And the other thing is, of course, that you might be the right person to be there while the doctor is having that conversation in the same way that my boss took the nurse that Sabine had confessed to back with us when he went to have that conversation because this was the person that Sabine felt safe to be vulnerable in front of so she was there as Sabine's advocate and if you are that person then maybe you could suggest that you could be there as a supporter when they're being given their news and then you've got the knowledge to carry on chatting to them about it afterwards and the doctors have to go off to do whatever else doctors have to do. So I think that's a really lovely idea. Perhaps I know that they have a, a monthly meeting, whether that's happening at the moment or not, I'm not sure. But Jane Jordan is the one who, who runs those meetings. It could be a really good topic to take back to that meeting when they restart. We have another couple of questions. Um, they're actually, I don't know, um, possibly we can think about both of them at the same time. One is, um, how do you discuss the process of dying with family members who have different goals than the client? But we also have, um, how do you manage the difficult conversations with families and patients that refuse to give up? So I guess that's different goals than us. Okay. So I, so I guess there isn't a one size fits all. And one of the things about having conversations with people is thinking about the principle of communicating rather than the script. So there isn't a thing that we've got to deliver. There's an understanding that we need to reach of each other. So I need to be listening as much as I'm talking, really. So there are people who don't want to give up yet. And they have that right, of course. But also, sometimes the reason they don't want to give up is they're so terrified of what dying will be like, that what they're trying to do is not necessarily postpone death, but postpone doing the dying. So finding a way of having that conversation can be very useful. My long time experience of having that conversation or a conversation that sounds very like that with patients is that at the end of it, a little bit like Sabine, they're, they're incredibly relaxed. And then there's a kind of silence. And then they say, oh, can you tell my family that? I don't think that's what they're expecting at all. And what I usually do is say, well, I tell you what, why don't you tell them and I'll sit with you and I'll help? Because that actually helps me to hear what they heard, which is not always what you just said, of course, so that you can just make sure that it's heard again. Or I say, well, you know, you're in the, are they with you? No, I've come to the clinic on my own. Well, when's the next time that your palliative care nurse, your hospice nurse is visiting at home? why don't you ask your palliative care nurse to describe this with the family when they come home? Because I'm completely confident that any of us who's familiar with ordinary dying, this is the description they're going to give. So 
helping people to understand and you don't have to defy their expectations you simply have to talk about when dying is eventually happening what will it look like it doesn't mean i'm asking you to give up your chemotherapy it doesn't mean i'm asking you to stop your non-invasive ventilation we're just talking about when that time comes what will it look like and then you can start to think about how you will deal with that and then you can start to make other decisions about how invasive you want your treatment to continue to be in the meanwhile. We're not trying to persuade people to let themselves die. We're trying to enable people to understand what's going to happen when that inevitability arrives. Thank you. Shall we continue with the slide presentation and we can pick up some more um, things after that? Yeah, so only, only a few more minutes now, folks. So I was going to talk to you a little bit about feedback from having written a book about dying. I have to say, when I wrote a book about dying, what I wanted to do was enable people to understand dying the way my Nana had understood dying. And she'd understood it by being there, by seeing it, by knowing the people, by observing the process and seeing it often enough that she understood it. So... Some of you might have read the book, but most of you won't have done. But I need to tell you that it's not clever. It's not a textbook. It's just a book of stories. And it's just a book of stories about people living while they're dying. It includes the story of Sabine and how I didn't recognise dying until I heard it described to her. Um, and it includes lots of other stories about people just feeling their way through that, finding their ways through the conversations. And I wrote the conversations in some detail because I wanted readers to think of the person they knew and trusted in their healthcare team, in their hospice team, whoever it was, and think, I could have a conversation like this with that doctor, with that nurse, with that physiotherapist. What I hadn't anticipated was that healthcare professionals would pick this book up and say, oh, that's how I could have that conversation. So it's done surprisingly well, not just for the public, which is who I wrote it for, but for healthcare professionals as well. And I have had hundreds, hundreds of letters and messages. So some of the feedback from readers has been that they didn't realise that their dear person was dying. They were in the hospital and staff told them that they were very dehydrated, but we've put a drip up, um, that the kidneys are not working very well. And, you know, we're not sure he's well enough for dialysis. Oh, he's, he's got sepsis and we've started some antibiotics. All of those things are actually saying this person is sick enough that they could die, but nobody said that. And so when eventually dying happened or dying was obviously irreversible and the doctors got round to saying that, it was too late for them to get the family from the other coast. It was too late to have the tender conversations they wanted to have because the person had already lapsed into unconsciousness. Or they saw the breathing. And one of the things that happens during breathing at the end of life is because people can't feel the back of their throat anymore. When you think about how sensitive the back of your throat is, you know, if you if you swallow a bit of coffee down the wrong way, you have a toast crumb on the back of your throat, you'll cough, you'll swallow. If that doesn't clear it, you might even start gagging and retching to get it clear because it's a really primitive reflex to protect the airway. Once we're unconscious, we are not receiving those sensation messages anymore, which is of enormous comfort to me to, to realize that for the people I'm looking after. But it means that the fluid that we've used for mouth care or the saliva that's in the back of somebody's throat or mucus that's come up from the lungs, there's a little layer of it lying in the back of the throat. And now air is moving in and out of, their, of the person's body, in and out of their airway through that little film of fluid. And we know what air does in fluid, it bubbles. So we hear the bubbling, it's a kind of weird rattling noise that you don't normally hear because usually when people are deeply unconscious because they've had an accident or they're you know, in a diabetic coma or something like that, we lie them in a recovery 
position. So there's no fluid touching the back of their throat. And that's actually to stop them from vomiting and aspirating into their lungs. So we're protecting them. And we don't lie dying people in a recovery position. So here they are breathing in and out, making this weird noise, not bothering them at all. And the family going, what is that noise? And the bubbling sounds like it's coming up from their knees all the way up through their chest and out of their mouth. And it's a tiny film of fluid at the back of the throat. So explaining to the family that this is that noise that people refer to as the death rattle. And actually it just tells us this person is so, so deeply unconscious now that they can't feel the back of their throat. This is not uncomfortable for them, but it sounds very weird to us. Actually, it's comforting to me to know that he's so unconscious that he's tolerating that fluid there without trying to cough it or swallow it away. So we need to explain that to people. Otherwise, they are traumatized by their misunderstanding. One lady wrote to me and said, I've had therapy for PTSD since I watched my mum dying in what looked like agony. Um, I've been in therapy for five years. Finished reading the chapter about Sabine last night and I slept through the night last night for the first time since my mother died eight years ago. That's not good enough in terms of the care that we're offering people to leave somebody so traumatized. And then incredibly courageous people who've bought the book. One lady wrote to me the year before the pandemic, said to me, this is going to be my last Christmas. I've bought all my daughters your book for Christmas. I thought, oh, poor things. Um, and we're all going to read it. And then I'm going to discuss my last wishes with them. Wow. Aren't people just amazing? But I've had feedback from healthcare staff as well. And that was really interesting. I didn't know that you could explain things so fully, like I didn't know. Or I've got new scripts now. When I use these sorts of words, people really get what it is that I'm talking about. And person after person after person, nurses, paramedics, occupational therapists, physi physiotherapists, doctors saying, nobody taught us how to be with dying people in our training. All of our training was about saving lives and death as a failure to save. So we really need to revolutionize the training of our healthcare professionals as well, because we recruit them from the people who are living, remember that graph at the very beginning, at a time when we don't understand ordinary dying, we don't see it happen at home. We recruit them into our healthcare schools and then we train them to save lives. And nobody talks to us about this really important privilege of enabling people to be comfortable and well looked after as they reach the end of their lives. So we need to do something about changing the public understanding of dying. And none of us is going to be able to do this on our own. But all of us together is a pretty powerful army. So we need to think about this every time we're with a patient. There's their village around them and we can help them to understand. The patterns will be the same each time, even though this person is an individual, so it will be their way. We need to use the right language. We need to talk about dying, not passing. And we need to narrate the dying as it happens so that we're changing this family's understanding and thereby the public's understanding of dying. And nobody else is gonna do this for us. If we don't do it, then who will? So let's just have a think about how we can make this difference. Because in the end, dying is not about medicine. Dying is a deeply personal, profoundly social event. And what I think we need to do is give dying back to society with stories that enable people to understand how it can be lived even at the very end of life. And I'd like to invite all of you to be ambassadors for that transformation. Thank you, Kath, that was really, really lovely. Um, I'm looking at everybody who have these serene looks on their faces, those that still have the camera on, they've been nodding and smiling at you. I have a couple of comments from people, one uh, and a couple of questions, people saying how much they loved your book. But a question from somebody um, who's in, I think in long-term care, 
So when someone has terminal delirium, how do you help the family not to carry that image of their loved one as one of their last memories? Isn't that really hard? That is so hard. One of the things that I found really useful for families in delirium is helping families to listen to what the person is saying. Because very often, although what they're saying sounds to be just rubbish, when you really listen, they will be telling you things. So for example, um, Oh, I'm going to tell you about a crazy night when I was a junior doctor in a hospice and I got a phone call at like one o'clock in the morning from the most competent ward manager I've ever worked with. She used to run the neurological high dependency intensive care unit in our regional neurological centre. And then she came and worked at the hospice and she just I, I picked up the phone and I could hear panting down the phone. So that's never good. And she, I just heard her voice say, Kath, it's Anne, I need you, I need you now. And then the phone went dead and I thought, oh my God. So when I got there, the doors were open. Now the outside doors are always locked at night time. So something strange is going on. And when I get inside, what's, what's happened is absolute pandemonium. There have been patients running up and down the corridors and this is what has happened. During the day, an elderly man had been admitted to one of the four bedded bays. And he was a man who had a, a kidney cancer and kidney cancer does odd things. And sometimes it metastasizes into skin. So he had a metastasis on the top of his head, which looked like a hairstyle with a bun on the top. And he was really, really worried. He was a carer for his wife. He was really, really worried about leaving his wife not looked after. And in fact, his, his wife was being admitted to residential care while he came into the hospice to have his pain sorted out. And he hadn't been able to walk because of pain in his leg from a metastasis for about a week. So his caring for her had started to break down. So he's in one bed and he's worrying about his wife and the nurse is settling him down. And he's saying, I need to phone my wife. And she said, yes, this is in the olden days where we had a, a phone on wheels. I'll bring you the phone in a minute. So the nurse went out of the bay and as she went out, she heard the guy in the bed opposite, who was a man with squamous lung cancer, say to the newbie, don't believe her. They've had my wife in a cupboard for weeks. So she knew that there was somebody a little bit muddled in that bay. And over the course of the day, the muddled man got progressively more muddled. At the other end of the hospice, there was a woman with a brain tumor who had become nonverbal because of her brain tumor, but she used to attract attention by yowling. And so she was sitting at the other end of the corridor making a yowling noise. And halfway down the corridor in a single bedroom, there was a lady called, I'm going to call her June. And June had, uh, I think, metastatic breast cancer, but she was a worrier. And because she was a worrier, her daughters had not told her, grown up daughters had not told her that her old auntie, who she usually looked after, had been taken into hospital because they didn't want her to worry. So sometime in the middle of the night, the man with the sore leg and the hair bun heard the yowling down the corridor and thought it was his wife calling for him. And because he was so worried about his wife, he got out of bed and started to walk down the corridor. The guy opposite him also heard the yowling and realized that it was his wife. And he thought that his neighbor was going to go down the corridor and make love to his wife. So he got up to follow him. Halfway down the corridor, they met June who had come out of her bedroom because the house was on fire and she had to save Auntie Mary. When she turned, she saw Auntie Mary with her hair in a bun so she went to give Auntie Mary a big cuddle, at which point the other guy started beating the guy with the hair in a bun over his head for carrying on with his wife. Meanwhile, 
the other lady is still yowling at the other end of the corridor. So that was the point at which the ward sister had made that phone call. And, you know, there were two qualified staff, one healthcare assistant, there were 20 beds and there was pandemonium. So by the time I got there, everybody was back in bed. June was convinced that the house was on fire and that Auntie Mary might be going to die. So we started with June and we worked out that she had a, a very high pyrexia because she actually had a urinary tract infection. Um, but we talked about worrying about whether Auntie Mary was going to die and where was Auntie Mary and I've tried to phone home today and I couldn't get through to Auntie Mary. So now we have to tell June the truth that actually Auntie Mary isn't well and she's in hospital. And she'd have been a lot less worried about Auntie Mary if she'd known that in the first place. And her confusion about the place being on fire was actually because she was pyrexial and somebody's life is in danger. It's in fact not Auntie Mary's, it's hers. So her world makes sense. Somebody's life is in danger and it's something to do with being very hot. Does, does that make sense? So teaching families to listen to what people are saying and who they're talking about helps them to anchor back to what's real. The other guys, well, it's really interesting how love can overcome the pain in your leg to go and look for your wife. So he was disorientated simply because he was in a new place. His renal function wasn't great and he could hear a noise that sounded to him like it might be his wife. So we got him back to bed and we, when we got his electrolytes back, he was a bit dehydrated, which wasn't good for his poor renal function. He only had one kidney and he managed to drink a lot rather than having to put IVs up during the night. The other guy whose wife had been in a cupboard for several weeks was much more of a worry to me. And actually, when I phoned to the hospital to get his blood results from that morning, which weren't back yet, he actually was had tipped into hypercalcemia. So we needed to treat his hypercalcemia to reverse his delirium in order to get him as well as he had been the week before, which was actually pretty well. So when people have delirium, if we can't reverse it, which we could for two of those people, then what we need to do is listen to what they're saying to us. And very often they're talking about people who matter, times that matter. They're looking for tickets. They're trying to find their passports. They're worried about missing the train. There's lots of travel stuff going on, which is all about departures. So they're talking about what's happening. And very often we can help families to get alongside them by talking to them in their metaphor. So don't worry about the train, dad. We'll make sure you don't miss it. And we will all make sure that we come to the station and we won't miss saying goodbye. So you can start to make sense of the nonsense. What's really difficult though is watching people who've got agitated delirium, isn't it? And trying to draw that fine line between, are we going to offer sedation for this person for their benefit? Or is it actually the family's agitation about the agitation that's making me worry about whether I should be giving something to sedate the person? And, and I think at end of life, we run into that problem a lot of the time. Should I um, dry secretions that are not bothering the patient to stop the death rattle upsetting the family? Should I sedate this person who's talking about things from long ago and is a little bit agitated and a little bit restless or should I actually stick them in a wheelchair and ask the daughter to take them out and round the grounds and do some bird watching because actually they're full of energy it's going to take a huge dollop of something to sedate them and really what they need is simply to be in a space that's familiar and safe with my daughter watching some birds could be a good way of doing that it's really hard and I haven't got a I haven't got a, a kind of magic panacea. Sorry. Thank you. We're coming up towards the end of our session. And I was wondering if anybody had any more things that they wanted to put into the chat box. In the meantime, while you're thinking about that, some people have had to leave, unfortunately, because they're at work um, and they've sent you some lovely messages. Um, Thank you. One of the questions that we had was about whether people who are unconscious can still hear. Well, you did the research. British Columbia University did the research. Do you know this? So they, they published it last year and 
what they'd done was put EEG leads on the heads of people who were dying who'd given permission in advance. Were any of you, have you got a hand up thing? Were any of you involved in this? So these people gave permission in advance. So they were all people in palliative care. And as they were dying, they, um, their EEG was recorded and there was a tape recording of, of the room. And what they were able to show was that in deep unconsciousness and very close to death, EEGs were still showing changes in brain waves in response to noise around the person. So it looks like the brain responds to noise. So the brain is hearing noise, but obviously without doing functional MRI scanning, which I don't know how we would get ethics permission to stick dying people into a functional MRI scanner. We don't know whether what they're doing is being slightly more um, activated by the fact that there's a noise beside them or whether they actually think, oh, this is my dear wife of the last 50 years. I recognize her voice and it's a huge comfort that she's there. So we don't know what is going on in the brain, but we definitely know that the brain is still responding to noise very close to death. And then we know what we know. So what do we know? We know that agitated people become calmer when the right voice is in the room. We know that people wait for news People who should have been dead days ago hang on for the piece of news or they hang on for the right voice to be in the room before they die. We know that people synchronize their breathing to the music that's on in the room when they, we think, what are long beyond being conscious. So we've got a huge pool of observations of seeing people apparently responding to voice towards the very end of life. And the research from University of British Columbia is starting to suggest that those are not, that's not wishful thinking on our part, that there is something happening there. And somebody is commenting to say that uh, we do usually say that people can hear and not to say anything in front of the person that you wouldn't say if they were awake. And yeah, somebody, on the, right. somebody on the chat box has shared the research um, link for us, which is lovely. Thanks very much for Thank that. Thank you. Okay, so I think it's about time to um, wrap up. If there's anything anybody wants to say that um, they haven't put into the chat box yet, they can. But thank you so much, Kath. It's been absolutely amazing. I, I was hoping that maybe we might persuade you to come back and do some um, more talking to us, perhaps. If anybody has any themes that they would like to be picked up or uh, suggestions for topics, if that would be something that people would want please put it into the chat box for us thank you very much everybody